Hello, welcome. Sorry it's been a little while uh, since since we had some more coming out into the night time of the year, but I <clears throat> have been a little under the weather, slowly starting to get better again, which is awesome. And um, But my enthusiasm for this topic and my interest in it has definitely not waned, just more the getting it all together to share it with you that has taken me a little bit longer than I would have liked. But welcome back. So we're not there yet, are we? We're not there to the dark time of year, the solstitial point that will come uh, at the 20th, 21st of December. And equally, I'll draw attention in a coming video I hope to get out later this week about the uh, different ways of using sun and moon timing to really look at when the new year starts, if we're allowing that year to start uh, again with the coming of the light. Um, we're really looking for not only the sun to tell us it's returning, the light's returning, but the moon as well. One thing that is really spectacular that's happening right now in the coming days is uh, this full moon in Gemini, in tropical Gemini. And I want to speak to it a little bit in this video and also to the um, phase that we're in within the Mars retrograde. And there'll be some other videos that I have included as part of this segment. Um, but to start with, you know, one thing that I want to mention is that the uh, position of the moon's arc through the sky is raising up for us in the northern hemisphere. Um, and the position of the, the moon is actually correlating to six months prior to the position of the sun. So what we'll notice is that as the sun dips lower and lower within our um, sky, the arc of the night time, the arc of the night, the planets in the night, but also the way that the heavens are moving in the night time uh, rises up higher and higher. Um, so we're going to get the highest moons, the full moons that we're going to get will occur uh, around this time of year. And uh, I believe that this one that's coming is statistically like the one that will be the highest in the sky. Um, equally, you know, for many parts of the world, uh, due to declination, which is uh, another way of looking at um, the planets in relation to like uh, the projected grid from the Earth out outwards. Um, the declination of the Moon and of Mars is quite similar. So in this way, you can get something that is going to occur with this full Moon, which is an occlusion of a planet or star. And in this case, that will be the case with Mars. We'll look at it a little bit in a moment with some uh, with some charts to talk about things that are ongoing uh, that might be of interest. But in general, I've always been fascinated with this idea that in the winter, the arc of the night is highest, you know, uh, and it really shows the primacy of the path of the moon in the nighttime of year, um, equally drawing us into the uh, way in which the lunar, uh, the lunar domain, the domain of, um, what is hidden and revealed by the coming and goings of light are really highlighted. There's an interesting thing too that is happening around this time of year that we just have had a little bit of a taste of it happen over yesterday and today in the way that some of the, the customs and practices of certain areas of, of Northern Europe align with, 
with uh, this moment of what is happening now. You know, in late November, um, where I live in Scotland, we started to get the first of what we might call the autumnal storms or like the storms that are taking us into winter. And the storms of winter are particularly uh, ferocious in the way in which they ride across the earth. And I think that this powerful uh, meteorological aspect, the way in which the weather is so um, powerful in the north at this time of year, um, can help us to understand why there are stories of uh, things that we would call like that, that get called generally in uh, the stories of Northern Europe um, as the wild hunt. You know, this idea that uh, these storms are actually a procession that is m moving across the land. Um, and similarly, when you look at this time, this time is marked by all kinds of processions, by uh, monstrous um, humanoid uh, beings, being and, and processions of groups that are made up of the fae, of the dead, of uh, spirits that take on all different forms, be they kind of morphic forms like animal, human, plant. They can be of all of these, actually. Uh, this parade of or procession of um, amalgams, if you will, or assemblages that represent the unseen world, but also the world uh, that is laying in a... Mm, how would you say, is not kind of a full expression of the agency of the other world, you know, uh, and the many, the many others that inhabit it. And on the 5th, which was, yeah, not that long ago, yesterday, uh, we have the festival, or the time that's associated with the figure Krampus, um, Krampusnacht. And then that day is followed by another procession by St. Nicholas. You have saints as well leading the procession. You have old gods like Odin leading this procession. This procession is often made up, as I said, of otherworldly beings. Um, often a theme that is there within these processions is that these other, these beings, be they uh, saintly or ghostly, demonic or uh, otherwise, they tend to carry sources of light. And with this light, uh, they're moving across the land. And here we start to see a really unique relationship between the darkest time of year, the beings that are most active at this time of year, and the purpose or the the um, the agency that they express onto the world, which is the bringing back of light. And I've always found this very fascinating that this time of year, and particularly the way in which the beings of the night time of year, um, and again. They range quite a large uh, spectrum, but the idea that they bring forth back, they bring the light back with their their manifestation of their darkness, uh, that they carry it, you know, back. Um, and it's interesting that lots of traditions, there's this mirroring of one one particular form that is it is very monstrous and terrifying and another that is very holy and saintly um this is you know we could say it's hard to say that that is a a central characteristic amongst all the stories but it doesn't matter really that piece you know we can see this as a way of of of, of meeting that form in many different faces. Um, 
So, you know, outside of turning your attention to some of that, and outside of maybe engaging in it or uh, attending to it, you know, there is this idea that we give honor and respect to the forces that move in the dark. And I uh, think that, you know, there are many different ways to connect with this in one of the future, uh, in the, the next video, um, we'll talk about uh, the practice of the year walk. Um, and this is that idea that we can hint at now or talk about a bit now, which is going out uh, to places that are um, of interest to you, uh, where you can connect with the other world, be they cemeteries, for example, or old sites, and going at twilight or at nighttime and walking in complete silence and having that experience inform the wayfinding of what is to come in the next year. There'll be more on that uh, in, in the next video. So this is also a time of gathering all those things that you might have in your own home as sources of light. So this is the time to get things like that together, you know, gather candles, um, and lanterns and other sources of light, you can go ahead and start lighting them in this dark moment uh, as a way of honoring those forces of darkness that are carrying the light back to into being across the land at this time, um, or those forces that are aligned with this time of year. Again, be they more monstrous or more holy. Um, Turning to look a little bit at the this coming lunation, I'll just uh, do a little bit here to share my screen. Um, this is now, and what we can see is the moon has just entered into Gemini as of right now. We can see also that um, Mars is still... Uh, in its retrograde and what's going to happen with this if we just move it forward a little bit is that as uh, the moon comes in to be there with Mars we see the opposition of the Sun and Mars uh, at the same time that the moon the full moon is occurring so again the opposition of the Sun and the moon um, this is an interesting moment. It is kind of like, I call it full, the full Mars, you know, in that um, this is the moment when Mars is closest to the Earth. This is the moment when Mars will, just as the full moon will rise as the sun is setting, Mars will rise as the sun is setting, and it becomes... Uh, this Lord of the Night, you know, this uh, Red Lord of the Night. And uh, something that a lot of uh, people are have been mentioning is the proximity that uh, this lunation has to some, some important stars. I think that, you know, all of these, these relationships to Rigel and to... Uh, Aldebaran, which is uh, both, they're both very interesting stars. They both uh, have things that relate to prominence. I do think can help us understand why we really will gain so much by attending to what has become most obvious to us during the Mars retrograde, depending on where this is happening for you. You know, you can think about the pairing of the houses. You know, what house is associated with Sagittarius and Gemini? What houses bring in the mutable uh, signs? Because these houses are in uh, a square relationship to this lunation. Um, we can think about what during the Mars retrograde has become the most obvious that is in need 
of integration at this time, you know, and normally it shows, it shows itself similarly to the way Mars retrograde shows itself by becoming red and inflamed. So there may be aspects of your life that are really showing themselves due to, to, to their uh, visible signs of being inflamed. We may consider, you know, how we attend to those parts in order to bring about something new. Okay, so, sorry about that, I need to blow my nose. <laughs> um, so yes, the full moon itself, you know, by, by itself, and then we can think about uh, the context a little bit further. The full moon is a very heightened moment. You know, it's the moment whereby the moon has collected as much light as she possibly can, and she begins to give that light back towards uh, all the different things that she's collected it, or towards different aims. Um, and this light of Mars is the last one that she collects right at that moment before that transition point. It's also fascinating that Mars is reaching the middle of its cycle in terms of the retrograde cycle, that this is also full Mars, you know? So what is of the, what is of an, an extreme, you know, what is of a heightened nature as it relates to this? Um, I think similarly, the way that the moon will uh, occult or cover the light of Mars shows its complete absorption of its light, you know, in that way, at least from the perspective of us here on Earth. Um, and as I've said before, with each lunation, you know, we then have the many days that precede it where the things that are put in motion by that lunation, so in this case on the 7th of December, you know, going all the way around until they, uh, so this is coming to, again, right as the sun moves into Capricorn, and before this next new moon is going to occur on the 24th in Capricorn, 23rd, 24th, we have uh, the coming to, to be of what is taking place within this full moon lunation. So while it is a moment, you know, that we can pay attention to, it's really the ripening of all of that next several days that we want to give some attention to also, because this is showing how it plays out, how those themes play out for us. Um, I do think that uh, there are some interesting features that are here. One of which is the fact that it's happening within the Sagittarius uh, Gemini axis. The idea that uh, this axis has a lot to do with information, synthesis of information, and the expression of information or we could say knowledge, you know, also we could take a break from knowledge, the synthesis of knowledge and the expression of knowledge or the development of knowledge and the exploration of knowledge. So in this way, this is a very powerful uh, moment for us to look at what is what is red hot, you know, or shining with this bright red light within our life? And how is it meant to be integrated into a fuller understanding of these aspects of your life? You know, and we can look at the pairing of these two houses. So if this is within the fourth and the tenth, you know, we can be thinking about what is becoming obvious about the tensions between home and the work or the efforts you get up to um, and uh, 
you know, where is the uh, agreement that can be struck between those two in order to bring about uh, a healing of this uh, martial energetic power? Um, you know, if it's happening between the first and the seventh, it may have a lot to do with the uh, reddening or the inflammation of yourself and the way in which the acknowledgement of that and the, the integrated power that can come out from uh, this cycle uh, in the self-other relationship, you know, being really important. Um, so yeah, sit with that and see, you know, see how, how that, um, lays with you. And, you know, you can, um, reflect on that, uh, and see, see what themes are really coming to the fore of it. But don't expect it all to come out just on the, just on the, the day of the full moon of the seventh. Allow it to be something that, um, rather than just on the 7th and the 8th, but a storyline that emerges and then is able to play out uh, in the coming weeks after that. And yes, there'll be more to come, but just wanted to, as I'm starting to feel better, to share a little bit with everyone. And equally, you know, try to start to become aware. There might be particular um, observances that you want to make as it relates to these, the movings and the processions of the uh, other representatives of the other world and their, uh, their, these accumulations moving across the land um, that you want to tangle with specifically. But, um, you know, have fun with that. And until next time, I hope you stay well.